Hello, and thank you for joining us this evening for the first part in our State of Donaldson and Hermitage series. Uh, this part of the series is specifically dedicated to our uh, Metro Nashville elected officials. I'm Jordan Huffman, and I'm the president of the Donaldson Hermitage Neighborhood Alliance. Tonight, we are joined by elected representatives uh, from all uh, forms of our metro government to talk about current and upcoming projects within their respective districts. With us this evening are Council Member Larry Hager from District 11, Council Member Aaron Evans from District 12, Council Member Russ Bradford from District 13, and Council Member Jeff Syracuse from District 15. Also with us are at-large member Bob Mendez, and last but not least, District 4 School Board member John Little. Council Member Kevin Roten could not be with us tonight. Tonight is his wedding anniversary, so we wish him well. Um, I do have a few updates to pass along on his behalf uh, when the time comes. I uh, also want to note that all elected officials, uh, including all at-large council members, uh, along with the mayor, were invited to this. Uh, I thank you all for uh, being here tonight, and we thank you for your willingness to uh, and commitment to transparency uh, for in our community and to answer questions from our community members. Uh, the format tonight will be very simple. Each person will receive 10 minutes to provide an update on a project or series of projects within your respective districts. The order was drawn at random, and we will kick it off with Council Member Bob Mendez. So Council Member Mendez, I will turn it over to you, sir. Thanks, Jordan. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I'm glad I could be here this evening. I know it's been a little bit of trouble scheduling it. Um, so as Jordan mentioned, I'm one of the at-large council members. Um, so I represent the whole city. Um, one of the unique perspectives I get is that um, we've got 35 individual council districts, each have got 18 to 20,000 or so people in it. And I usually uh, don't hear much from districts where the council members are doing a good job. And then there's always some council districts I hear from uh, more frequently. And I'm, uh, I'm really happy to report that I never hear from the districts um, in y'all's part of the city uh, about the council members being asleep at the wheel or not doing their job or not being responsive. And um, uh, at least for um, uh, one of the folks here, uh, um, their predecessor was, was somebody I ended up hearing from their district a lot. Um, so I really appreciate it when uh, district council members are doing a great job and, and I, um, don't get um, a lot of the day-to-day -day phone calls of things that people care a lot about, about livability. So I'm going to focus on um, some big, big picture things that impact the entire city um, that have been in the news and will continue to be in the news. And first, uh, I want to give an update about the city's finances generally. You know, at the beginning of this um, particular uh, mayoral term, you know, it was, it was just before COVID, and um, it was, uh, um, you know, the city's finances were in bad shape. You know, the state comptroller, this was in the news, the state comptroller was not happy with our finances. Um, water rates hadn't been raised in a decade, and, and we were forced by the state to do a large water rate increase. That was followed by COVID and then a property tax rate increase. And the good news is that after what was years of neglect, I think, in updating um, how the city's finances worked, um, the city's finances are on the road to being in good shape. It took a bunch of years, four, five, six years, to, to get the city into the spot where it was in 2019. And it, it shouldn't take that long um, to get the city in better financial shape. Uh, but it's going to take a few years. Um, that matters on our day-to-day -day life um, because it matters on our ability to fund the school system. It matters on our ability to build sidewalks, fix roads. And again, we're, we're headed to a better place. Um, and, um, and, and that's taken a lot of work from the council members and, and the mayor's office um, to work together for that. The next thing I want to touch on is um, a little bit of information about 
um, federal relief dollars uh, resulting from COVID and, and how that's going in, in Nashville. The numbers are really uh, mind boggling. Um, in 2020, when COVID was, was first getting going, under the CARES Act, the Federal CARES Act, $131 million of federal money um, came into Nashville and we were required to spend it by December 30th, 2020, so last December, and it was a, a really narrow focus of things that had to do with trying to keep people from getting sick, trying to treat people who are were sick, trying to um, protect our, our first responders. And so there was $130 million that was spent. Um, we, we came up with in the council um, a very transparent process um, where no one group got to decide how it was going to be spent. There were public meetings. Um, where the media attended and it was a good cross section of the county that made recommendations to the mayor's office and the council about how to spend that money. And it really was on immediate relief efforts. Round two of federal money is there's, uh, it's called the American Rescue Plan. And there's another $259 million, so a quarter of a billion dollars that's come into Metro um, from the federal government. And there's looser restrictions on what we can spend it on. Um, and we've got more time, it'll be a couple of years. And there are things like infrastructure and um, broadband deployment are things that are on the list. And we've got a, a, a similar process where there's gonna be a public uh, committee with public meetings that make recommendations about what to do. And then it'll be subject to a council vote about how we spend the money. And this is a work in progress um, right now. Um, and you can, you can reach out to your individual council members or you can always email me at bob.mendez at nashville.gov. And I can give you an update about exactly what the city government, the mayor's office proposes to spend that money on. I'm hopeful that we end up seeing a fair amount of it in um, bringing our fire department's uh, equipment up to speed, um, continuing to make sure that our first responders are safe, um, that our school system um, is uh, making sure that they're safe while we finish going through COVID. Um, but $259 million is a lot of money um, and it's an ongoing process to figure out how we'll spend it. Um, the last topic that I'll touch on is economic development, you know, especially, um, for uh, those of us who live toward the edge of the county um, in any direction, a complaint over the last five, 10 years has been, how come there's all that spending downtown? Um, and between um, uh, a lot of efforts from current mayor, current council, there's been a, a substantial amount of reform. And I can, I can report that um, the sort of tax increment financing that benefited the you know two square miles of downtown almost exclusively is pretty much dead at this point. Um, we still have work to do on figuring out how, exactly what we're going to incentivize, where, what part of town, how much we're going to spend on it. Um, but um, we're at least in a better spot than um, all of it going into a very narrow area downtown. I know a lot of folks, um, uh, especially around your districts are interested in that, uh, what the transit professionals call the first mile. Um, you know, nobody likes sitting for 20 minutes on the road in their neighborhood just to get to the interstate. Um, that's something that the city is going to have to continue to work on. And hopefully we can focus more on that um, than um, just building things up in the immediate area downtown. Um, there are a couple of things, um, deals that will be coming down the pike, I think, in the next year. The mayor's office is very tight-lipped about exactly what the details are, um, but I think sometime in the next 12 months, there will be a proposal um, from the mayor's office and the Titans about what to do about um, improving the 25-year-old stadium that we've got downtown, um, and the mayor's office continues to work on uh, redevelopment of the racetrack um, out at the fairgrounds. Um, it's unclear. I mean, I guess, uh, well, I don't know what's going on with those deals. I just have a feeling that we'll be hearing about them from the mayor's office sometime in the next six to 12 months. Um, and Jordan, I think that's about it for my um, big topics for the county. 
Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, council member. Uh, great updates, uh, especially uh, from the perspective of our the only at large member. So thank you very much. All right, next up, uh, we've got council or not council, excuse me, uh, school board member John Little from the fourth district. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, Jordan, and, and thank you, Bob, and, and to the rest of everyone who's on this Zoom. I think what I've learned, the more information you can provide, um, it helps keep everybody informed um, and out of your, your inboxes and your voicemails. But as Jordan introduced, my name is John Little, and I represent School Board District 4 that covers Donaldson, Hermitage, and Old Hickory. It's solely in the McGavick cluster. Um, and so we have the elementaries, elementaries like Ruby Major, um, McGavick, Stanford, Montessori, Pennington, Hickman, and so on. We have the middle schools, we have the DuPonts, um, Hadley and Tyler, we have Two Rivers, we have Strive, um, we have a few more, but we have one high school and it's McGavick High. And so I just wanted to go over a few headlines that have been coming up and around it really benefit um, and represent school board district four. Um, and so one, um, we have some really awesome elementary schools um, in our district, elementary schools that are vibrant, that have been recognized academically. Um, and as we deal with COVID, um, I know I got a lot of questions around kind of protocol, got a lot of questions around masks, but as I can see, parents are sending their kids back to school. Um, one of the things that I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on is, is bus drivers. I want to say out of 100 messages um, that first month of school, um, about 20 of them were about the wait times for the bus drivers. And I can tell you, um, this is some parents that we have been focused on based on the calls that we have gotten. I can tell you we're looking at adding incentives um, and, and trying to hire bus drivers. But what has been going on is just it's hard for the county as a whole. Um, and so that's something that we're working on. Um, the big announcement is a lot of parents have been reaching out about the reimagined MMPS, which essentially takes fifth grade back to the elementary school and takes it out of the, the middle school. And I'll tell you parents from the elementaries, Ruby, Ruby Major, Andrew Jackson, but definitely have gotten a lot of emails and calls from Stanford Montessori that the McGavick cluster is set um, to be reimagined where Stanford Montessori and the rest of the elementary schools are going to be able to keep their kids at fifth graders in elementary, which is a, a pretty big deal. Um, one, it keeps kids in one place um, as we have gone through a pandemic um, and parents have a routine. The other side is we lose so many kids in the transition between fourth and fifth grade. And this will allow us to really stabilize our student population. Right now, Metro is about 81 to 83,000 kids. And so this will help a lot of parents rest their fears when they think about where do I send my kid um, to middle school. Um, the last thing I'll talk about, and I'll add on kind of from Councilman Bob Mendez, I think transparency is really important. And one of the things that I always talk about is our budget. And I know uh, Mr. Mendez went through some numbers, but this year in the MNPS, our budget, just the initial budget is a little bit over a billion dollars. Um, plus we have the rescue funds. And so there have been surveys that have been sent out about the ESSA funds. Um, if you have not received one, but you wanna receive one, please let me know and I'll get to it. But I also like, just continue to communicate out the needs that you need as, as parents, um, grandparents, teachers, and just our community, because our kids are the best thing that we send to the school system. And once we have a vibrant and thriving school system, I think it makes for a better community. Um, and so if you did want to reach out, if you didn't have my information, my phone number is 615-375-6466. Um, feel free to give me a call. My email is john.little at mnps.org. So john, J-O-H-N dot L-I-T-T-L-E -E at mnps.org. Or feel free to look me up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, which you can simply find me at Little for Schools. Um, thank you, Donaldson Hermitage, for even allowing me to 
talk about MMPS. The last time I was on here was back in October, November. There was a ton of engagement. So I'm always grateful for the leadership um, that you guys bring to the table and helping us get the word out about the many initiatives that we have in Donaldson, Hermitage, and Old Hickory. Yes, sir. And we appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks for the update uh, on uh, our school system. It's definitely a lot of questions right now. So appreciate you providing some answers. Yep. I'll jump in. All right. Next up, we have council member Aaron Evans. And I believe, Aaron, that you've got a slideshow too. Yes. Can you see my presentation file? Mm -hmm. You're putting okay. us to shame, Council Lady. Per perfect. <laughs> Listen, I, I have to keep myself on track, so I'm going to get started and, and be as quick, efficient as possible. Um, so thank you all for joining us here this evening. If you are a District 12 resident, I do have a virtual community meeting tonight. So consider this the appetizer for the full deep dive that we will do tomorrow evening at six o'clock. Um, wanted to hit some highlights just of some things that I have been uh, discussing with residents. I do send out a newsletter every Monday morning at 8.30 a.m. If you'd like to sign up, you can go to erinfor12.com uh, and I'll be able to send you uh, my newsletter every week. But I'm gonna hit some highlights on development. I wanna talk about the infamous shipping container. <laughs> I also wanna talk about uh, Central Pike and Old Hickory Boulevard. And lastly, I got a couple of good news items to share as well if I have enough time. Um, so from a development perspective, there's been several projects that have been a little bit up in the air that I just wanted to hit the highlights on. And one is uh, 5047 John Hager Road. Uh, this is a project uh, where land uh, management group is uh, looking to do an SP to build 90 houses. Uh, base zoning for this particular property would allow 60 houses. So we had numerous community meetings. And after all those community meetings, the project really didn't have enough support to move forward. And so currently land management group is looking at building under base zoning. And so this is uh, still potentially a development that will come to fruition in some form. Um, I also have a project. Uh, it's a, I wouldn't even call it a project. Basically, it's a gentleman at 3216 Earhart uh, Road who's interested in rezoning his almost three acres so that way he can build an additional house on his property. Um, it is property that does back up to the Bridgewater subdivision. Um, the proposal did pass at the Planning Commission and it's going to be on public hearing at the Metro Council on November the 2nd. So if you live in that area, you'll receive a notification soon from the property owner. Um, I already mentioned John Hager Road. So let me skip past here and get to 1624 Stewart's Ferry Pike. Um, this is something that recently passed the Planning Commission. It is a property of a little over two acres um, that has a historic home on it that was built in the 1890s called the Williams House. Um, the person who acquired the property was interested in subdividing the property and went through Metro Planning's um, process to be able to do so. Um, it did pass at the Planning Commission um, there are three lots that are now available that the owner is going to sell. And then there is also the lot that has the Williams house intact. And so I'm working with the property owner to look at um, adding a neighborhood conservation overlay onto that particular home um, because it is National Register of Historic Places eligible. And so that is something that I'm discussing with her at this time. But this entire process <laughs> on Stewart's Ferry Pike has really uh, triggered an interest from residents in looking at potentially doing a down zoning of several of the properties there. So there may be some community meetings in our future uh, under that discussion. Um, one of the biggest questions that I get <laughs> is about the shipping container. That's at Old Hickory Boulevard uh, in Bell Road. Um, the shipping container has been there since June and it has had numerous conversations between the Army Corps of Engineers, Metro Codes, Metro Planning, Public Works, every department possible in Metro, except for legal has touched uh, this, this conversation about the shipping container. Currently, this has um, been under an abate notice from Codes. Uh, the owner has not elected to move the container. And so we are waiting to find out if there's gonna be a court date with environmental court at the end of October. So unfortunately, we'll have to have the shipping container out there for a little bit longer. Um, I also wanted to mention a couple things I've been sharing in my newsletter related to Central Pike and Old Hickory Boulevard. Um, this is a very challenging intersection. I share this intersection with Kevin Roten in District 14. And um, one of the things that we elected to do because of the high crime um, that is being experienced in that area, um, the, the drug use, um, the property crimes, um, street crimes, a variety of things that shouldn't be happening, is we are replicating a process that Councilman Syracuse did 
did in Donaldson for the hospitality industry and building kind of a coalition of, of partners on Old Hickory Boulevard and Central Pike um, to really build relationships and start to work together to how uh, best identify and solve some of the issues that we're seeing at this intersection. So we had our first call this past Friday. I had attendees from North Lake Village Shopping Center, Burning Tree Apartments, Hermitage Flats, um, the Seven Point Shopping Center, Roadway Inn, uh, ownership was there and they also have interest from MAPCO and a variety of other uh, businesses in the area as well as churches um, and then as uh, other property management companies and so we're going to continue to have these calls uh, once a month uh, and then I'll have some uh, ongoing conversation uh, with those property owners and with MNPD so I appreciate our precinct um, leadership uh, including Commander Hickerson and Sergeant uh, Weaver for participating and, and being willing to partner on this initiative as we move forward. Um, we do have a property at this intersection, the Vista Inn, that is under contract uh, for potential development. Um, and so that is one of the challenge properties um, that is over there that has required a lot of attention from MNPD. It's very early in the process. Um, there is a PUD overlay, a commercial PUD that's sitting on top of this property. And so the PUD will have to be amended and potentially, uh, you know, rezoned with an SP. And so we're still in very early conversations about that. So there's a lot of interest in what's going on over here. And I will continue to update on my Facebook page as well as in my newsletter. Um, a couple items of good news that I wanted to mention. First of all, we do did have a couple of District 12 residents that were appointed to boards and commissions over the last couple of months. We had Mr. Alex Lorenz, who was uh, appointed to the Farmers Market Board. We also had Ms. Teresa Driver, who was uh, appointed to the CATV Special Committee. So I congratulate them. And if anybody else is interested in serving on a board or commission with Metro, feel free to email me and I'm happy to put you in touch. Um, in addition, most recent news, um, our local firefighters union, the IAFF Local uh, 140, had a recent election and District 12 resident, Mr. Danny Yates, um, has become president. And so he will be very visible at council meetings and working with the council on initiatives related to um, interest for the firefighters. So I'd like to congratulate him for that as well. Um, Ruby Major Elementary School was recognized as a PTA School of Excellence. I was able to attend their celebration last week, and it was uh, great to see so many engaged parents parents and partners kind of working together uh, to make their school as excellent as possible. Um, also, because everybody's talking about hamburgers <laughs> in Hermitage, uh, the North Lake Village is making progress and we are getting a burger fi uh, and there's a location of that in Maryland Farms. And so we're getting a burger place too. It's not just Kevin Roden. So uh, those are the biggest things that I wanted to mention tonight. And of course, if you'd like to reach out, feel free. Here is all of my contact information, including my email address and phone number. And I appreciate your time and look forward to talking to more of you tomorrow night, where we'll talk for an hour and a half about all the things that are happening in District 12. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Evans. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on in, in your district, for sure. We appreciate your time. Uh, next up, uh, from uh, District 15, uh, the one and only Council Member Jeff Syracuse. Thank you, sir, for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. I have to follow uh, Council Member Evans there with that extraordinary presentation. Great job, <laughs> Member Evans. Uh, I'm going to be talking about hamburgers in just a second as well. But um, uh, first, from a broad perspective, and you probably heard me say this before, I divide the, the district really up into three parts as far as managing it. Uh, the, the first section we'll talk about will go from south to north. Uh, the stretch along Elm Hill Pike, Donaldson Pike, uh, just north of 40, that's where you have some industrial uh, hotels um, and, and whatnot. Um, uh, that area is, is, is doing well. As, as Aaron mentioned, um, as usually happens during the holidays, we have an uptick in some petty crime issues or, or whatnot. The pandemic certainly exacerbated that. And what we did not have, and kind of, kind of went back to my roots, is I created a uh, neighborhood watch network, if you will, amongst the hospitality business community so that they had a strong communication network uh, with our Hermitage precinct. And it has been very successful. Uh, one example is thanks to Opryland Hotel, um, they have a text-based system that they use for communication amongst their staff and whatnot. They have expanded that to other hotels and uh, motels in the area so that when something happens, say like in the middle of the night, 
and you don't find out about it when you until you wake up and you see that your car window has been uh, smashed or whatever at nine or ten o'clock in the morning, it's too late really for for the police to be effective in that. So having a stronger communication network has been a big priority for me in that regard, and it has been uh, successful, and we're going to continue that. Um, the Donaldson Pike I-40 interchange is something I, I get questions about a lot. Um, I know that both the airport and TDOT had hoped that this project would have uh, started already. Um, there is a, a lawsuit with a subcontractor, a colonial uh, pipe company, and I don't know that the, the details with it, but that is the delay uh, reason there. Um, as soon as it's resolved, uh, we'll start seeing that project move forward. It's a pretty big project, uh, suffice to say, um, and it's going to be uh, pretty neat, a, di a diverging diamond interchange, and you can Google it and actually see how it's going to function. Um, and uh, so that project hopefully will kick off soon and is, is part of our uh, huge airport <laughs> expansion. Um, the second part of, of the community is in Donaldson is really the heart of Donaldson around the plaza, uh, the, the urban design overlay, and the supporting neighborhoods around it. Uh, certainly the, the, the biggest news there is uh, where are we headed with the, the new Donaldson Library? Um, I'm in weekly uh, construction team meetings there. Um, it is making great progress. Um, it's, a, it's a big team from multiple departments uh, and whatnot, from IT to, to arts, to library, of course, to, um, uh, to uh, NDOT and, and, and planning and, and everybody else. Um, I think it's uh, uh, pretty, I'm pretty confident to say that by the end of this year, hopefully as a Christmas present, we'll have an unveiling of what the, the library is going to look like. And the, the construction probably will be towards the end of the spring of, of next year. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to folks seeing once the final design is, is done. Um, and I know everybody is gonna be um, really happy with it. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that project, of course. Um, and then I mentioned, uh, speaking of hamburgers, um, everybody will, will kind of remember it in, in the news where um, Whataburger had mentioned uh, several locations within the county where they were expanding. Uh, and they mentioned uh, one of those right on Lebanon Pike. Um, the challenge has been, and, and then I got a call from the news media and I had to say, well, wait a second, it's uh, not necessarily a done deal. And the reason is, is because um, they want to go right in the heart of the urban design overlay, the downtown Donaldson UDO. Um, and unfortunately, a auto-oriented drive-through fast food burger restaurant doesn't necessarily fit within what the design was to try to move more auto-oriented businesses out and have more of an urban walkable village. Um, so I, I have been working with them and their engineer to try to see if we could make this work. Um, and I'm, st I'm still open to it. And uh, I, I appreciate that they have uh, been working in good faith to try to, uh, to make it work. They don't have an urban model, really. Um, their, their, their business is uh, uh, based on having a drive-through. Um, so it, I don't know if it's going to work, but they are trying. I've seen a few different versions. They, they only have a cookie cutter model, basically, right? They have a piece of land. They put their, uh, their, their restaurant there, and it is what it is. Um, but that's not really how, when we put this uh, UDO in, in place in 2009, this is not really what we envisioned. But they have tried to tweak their model to make it a more urban style, um, but the drive-through is really the issue. So um, we're still working through it. I don't know if it's going to work out or not, but um, we'll, we, we will see. Um, the big sidewalk project on, uh, in, in Donaldson, in the heart of Donaldson, from McGavick to Old Lebanon Pike on the north side um, has moved. This has been, I, I, I half joke that it took Phil Claiborne, my, my predecessor, eight years to get the funding for this. It's going to take me eight years to get the sidewalk put in place. Um, but we are at the stage now where of the, the right-of-way acquisition. Um, and so uh, NDOT is, is uh, working on that, general services as well. Um, I am hopeful that we could see some construction maybe the end of 22. Um, but this will really dress up uh, the, the community really nice, put in the requisite infrastructure we need to give us great connectivity. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful to at least get that project started um, before the end of my term. Um, the last piece of the district is the Opryland, Music Valley, Pennington Bend area. I have uh, really not 
approved of any zone change in Pennington Bend over the last two and a half, three years. And the reason is, is because we are starting to put 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound sack out there. Um, there's only so much infrastructure out there and there's only so much more that you can do to improve uh, Pennington Bend Road, which is uh, very much a narrow two lane country road, if you will. Um, and so there was one uh, development um, at uh, the corner uh, or the intersection rather of Pennington Bend and Lock 2 Road um, where they wanted to put 43 nice single family homes. Um, ultimately that, that failed because I am focused on creating um, connectivity within Pennington Bend. Lock 2 Park is at the tip of, of Pennington Bend. Um, and one of my goals also is to, is to get a, a master planning process for Lock 2 Park because anybody that lives up there knows that park needs some TLC for sure. Um, but we should be thoughtful about any further development in Pennington Bend that has some potential <coughs> connectivity from the park to the existing neighborhoods, to any future neighborhoods. Um, if you look at the 130-acre Ryman-Lincoln uh, development that is the first phase is going in now, instead of a sidewalk along Pennington Bend, there is about a 12 foot wide lighted multimodal path. Um, that to me sets a precedent, if you will, about how the pedestrian infrastructure needs to flow through the area. Um, so I've been working a lot with NDOT uh, and planning about how we achieve that because we're not going to get major upgrades and I don't think the neighbors out there really want to Pennington Bend Road. I don't think anybody wants to widen it and I don't think that in any of our lifetimes, we're going to see major sidewalk and stormwater infrastructure on uh, the, uh, the entirety of Pennington Bend. So what I'm trying to do is some pragmatic pedestrian connectivity um, and put the policy in place first so that as any future development happens, that we have um, some really thoughtful and, and uh, intentional uh, development uh, there. Um, so that's, I, th I think that's about it um, for, for the district. Um, I appreciate as always DHNA doing this. Thanks Jordan. Yeah. Council member Syracuse, thanks for the great update. A lot of exciting stuff going on in your district. Uh, at the beginning of the session tonight, I had mentioned that, that council member Roten is out due to his wedding anniversary. Uh, he did pass along a few updates that just wanted to ensure that we were able to cover here as well. Um, so in no particular order, uh, just wanted to talk about a few of these. Uh, the first has to do with the Ravenwood Park grand opening. Uh, so it got washed out literally uh, last month, and uh, that has been rescheduled for uh, October the 23rd at 10 a.m. So if you are interested, um, October 23rd at 10 a.m., and we'll post information about that on our Facebook page as well. Um, also, I uh, wanted to pass along that the new park uh, at the Hermitage Library is almost 100% complete. Uh, the sidewalk portion uh, that is going to connect Dotson Chapel to the Hermitage Library should be connected, uh, completed within the next few weeks. So very exciting. A lot of stuff going on uh, in that area, and uh, that sidewalk is really going to connect a, a lot of neighborhoods. So pretty excited about that. Uh, a couple of community meetings to uh, just bring of note. The first is on October the 4th. Uh, that's going to take place at Stateland Baptist Church and it is going to be focused on a possible development at Hills Lane and Old Hickory Boulevard. So uh, if you do live in that general vicinity, uh, please make sure that you do make an effort to uh, show out uh, at that meeting uh, on October the 4th at uh, Stateland Baptist Church. Uh, also, there will be a community meeting that will be scheduled very soon um, regarding the space that I mentioned before. Uh, so the Hermitage Library area, so Central Pike uh, within that area, there is a new potential retail residential development that's going to be coming in to that area. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. So I uh, do encourage everyone to, to tune in uh, to, to that when that information is made available. I think the developer is still lining up a date for that. 
Um, and just a couple more updates. I uh, do want to pass along and very, very excited about this since it does take place in District 14. Uh, the DHNA, uh, in partnership with the Hermitage Library, will be hosting uh, a community Christmas tree uh, in Hermitage this year. Uh, some will say that this is the uh, first community Christmas tree in Hermitage. Uh, others will say at least in a long time. Uh, depends on who you ask. Regardless, we thought that uh, it's definitely a good year to bring a little extra Christmas cheer to the community. Uh, that tree lighting is going to be on December the 2nd. Uh, the lighting is going to start uh, right around 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to have some uh, fun activities for the family, so uh, definitely make an effort to come out, and uh, more information will be coming on that as well. And last but not least, uh, not to be outdone, uh, definitely wanted to make sure that I mentioned that the Whataburger in District 14 will be finished up in November. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Council Member Russ Bradford. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate everybody tuning in and hearing all these wonderful updates from our amazing coalition of elected officials for the Donaldson Hermitage area. Um, much like with Jeff's district, my district has uh, a few character areas. So I'm gonna try and break my report down into those areas, starting with the area by the lake. So over the past year, I've been working with a developer who wanted to develop a property on Elm Hill Pike. This property, as Council Member Mendez probably remembers a few years ago, kind of led to some contentious meetings. Uh, and so I decided I wanted to make sure when this issue came up, we were going, I was going to make sure that we didn't have that same situation. So had several meetings with the community and developer over the course of the year. And um, over the summer, the council passed the, the SP zoning for the preserve at Priest Lake. It's going to be about 33 units, a mixture of some townhomes and some single family um, in the parcel right behind the child care center. And so last um, report I received from um, Josh Stites, the developer, is they're expecting sometime after the holidays to start breaking ground um, once they get final plat approval. So that's, my, that's the first major um, redevelopment in District 13 since Wilden Point went in about 20 years ago. So there are, there's a lot of interest in the area. I've got two more um, parcels that I've had community meetings on or will be having community meetings on um, along the Pulley Road area. And then another developer has reached out about um, property on Massman just south of I-40 and M Hill Pike, um, wanting to do townhomes, single family homes on about eight acres out there. So stay tuned um, to my newsletters and to social media for updates on those community meetings and how those parcels are coming along. Um, I've been working with a local resident and business owner to see if we can open up a coffee shop or some um, cafe type business on the pre in the Priest Point Shopping Center by the lake to try and provide some more family friendly um, spaces in a shopping center. Um, so far, no, no big announcements or anything moving there other than just preliminary talks. Um, with that area, we've, we've had some issues with public safety. It's been going on for a few years, but it seems like it's gotten worse over time. So I've been having weekly conversations with our um, police staff at Hermitage Precinct discussing you know, what's going on, what actions are being taken. Uh, my conversations with Commander Hickerson they are well aware of the situation in the area. They have several um, operations that they are working on. And I'm also looking at doing similar to what Council Member Syracuse and Evans have done and will be doing, um, working with the police and the business owners to form a, a similar coalition, to try and help uh, everybody watch each other's back and to try and do what we can to bring the area you know, under control and having conversations about particular businesses and what we can do to get them shut down. Um, that takes up this side. Moving on to the airport area of the district, and Jeff kind of touched on the progress of the Donaldson Pike interchange. I know there's been some 
conversations in the past about the Harding Pike interchange. From all the conversations I've had with TDOT and the understanding I have is that this Donaldson Pike interchange is taking the place of the Harding Pike interchange. So Harding Pike is not gonna happen. Um, it's going, now gonna be the Donaldson Pike project. Also at the airport, just recently, they broke ground on the new Hilton branded uh, hotel that will go in the middle of their parking garage that will be across from their new admin complex. So looking forward to having a Hilton hotel in the district and the and just having that hotel at the airport, which kind of puts our airport on par with some of the, the larger airports in the country. So excited about the growth that we're seeing at the airport. Um, as more comes, comes along on that, I'll keep sh make sure everybody's updated. And the last area of the district is the Murfreesboro Pike area. I've been having conversations with um, the library um, department and the mayor's office in finance, trying to move up the timeline on getting a library for our district. Um, the library program district has identified the Murfreesboro Pike Riley Parkway area as a, a area that's underserved by libraries and they really want to move into that area. So a couple of months ago, I drove the area with the director of libraries, Ken Oliver. We located a couple of properties that would be suitable. And now we're working with the mayor's office and finance to see what we can do. Um, I'm hoping we can try and use some of the um, federal funds that are coming to our city to at least acquire the property. So that, that takes out the biggest hurdle. And then we can go through the regular budget process to get funding for the building and planning. Um, some good news for the district. Um, here recently, we had a resident in the district, Mr. Kijuan Taylor, who is the co-owner of both Cinema and Eighth and Roast, was just appointed and approved by council to the Tourism Convention Board. So congratulations, Mr. Taylor, on that. And then last summer, I was able to get Ms. Kanitha Carr appointed to the Health and Education Facilities Board. And so that's, those are two um, appointments in our district for boards and commissions in the city. So congratulations to both of them and look forward to all the work that they're going to do on those boards. As a update to our current committee structure, uh, we've worked to kind of streamline and reduce the number of committees that the council has. And in that process, a new committee was formed by the combination of several public parks, arts, libraries, and others were combined into the Public Facilities, Arts and Culture Committee. And the Vice Mayor announced earlier this week that I was appointed chair of that committee. So I look forward to working on the committee, serving on it, and hopefully by being on that committee, move us a little bit closer to that library I mentioned earlier and uh, some revitalization of our parks and greenways and public spaces in the district. Um, the last thing that I wanted to bring up is redistricting. Um, all of us on this call have had meetings with planning about the redistricting, redistricting process. I was informed based on the numbers that District 13 was 5% under what is considered the minimum allowed population. So more than likely, you're going to see District 13 get a little bit bigger. Um, and we've had conversations about what areas would be suitable. And so we'll, be, we'll know in a couple of weeks where our districts, what our districts will look like in the next 10 years. So, be, stay tuned for that. And again, all updates, uh, feel free to follow me on social media at Bradford or D13, or you can sign up for my monthly newsletter. Just go to westbradford.com slash the flight tracker and sign up. And with that, Jordan, I'll hand it back to you. Council member Bradford, thank you very much for the excellent update and thanks for being here. Okay, uh, last but not least from District 11, we've got Council Member Larry Hager with us. Council Member, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. I appreciate being here and I appreciate all the council members being on here, including John Little, our uh, school board representative. And uh, he may not know it, but I'm a graduate of McGavick High School a long time ago. I'm not going to go back that far, but. Uh, that school has stood the test of time for a long time. Excellent school, gave me a good education. Um, District 11, as you know, that covers most all of O'Hickory and part of Hermitage. Um, my name's Larry Hager, and this will be my seventh 
year on the council since I took up part of Darren Jernigan's term for a little over a year. Um, but I'll start at the bridge that goes over the Madison. That's where my district starts. Uh, that's still more of an industrial area over there. I do have a large townhouse development over there called Robinson Flats. Uh, it's 260 something townhouses on 38, 40 acres of land. That was zone industrial and uh, had meetings about it a year or two ago. Uh, and everybody would rather it been zone residential, put townhouses in there. So that's a pretty high density development in that area. Um, but they're about, uh, I'm going to say 35, 40% completed at this time. And they're just getting the permits as they sell. And they're selling pretty fast. So uh, they're very affordable. They're very nice looking townhouses. If you ever drive it way over toward Madison, you'll see them on the right over there. Uh, and they've done very well. Um, I did get a message the other day. Uh, we've been working to try to get a new community center in Oakery. Uh, the community center there was built by DuPont back in the 60s. So I have probably the oldest community center in Nashville. It's not ADA compatible. So for years, I've been working on that. So right now, uh, we've got the budget this year. We're starting on the plans. Tim Nitch with Parks uh, staying in contact with me. And then hopefully the next uh, capital improvement budget is going to be funded uh, for a new community center back there off on Donaldson Avenue in Hadley. And that part of that used to belong to Metro Water that was around the community center. And I got them to give it up once we shut down the water treatment plant back there. So that park is going to encompass about 18, 19 acres of land. So it's going to pretty, be a pretty nice sized park. It's going to have walking trails in the back. And I'm going to try to work with um, Centara. They own the land next to it that goes all the way down back to the lake. And I'm going to try to work with them maybe to have a walking trail that would go to the lake where kids could go back there and fish at Old Hickory Lake. Uh, so that's that's going to be an endeavor to do that, but I'm going to work toward that end. Uh, as far as developments on Robinson Road, which is Old Hickory Boulevard, uh, I got some small townhouse developments. I've had a few call that uh, want to put higher density in that area. Uh, Planning Commission, a lot of times I'll say, well, you go see the Planning Commission. And I had one the other day, they came back and said they thought it was too dense, which I agreed with them. So I've told the developer to go back to the drawing board, uh, make it less dense. I do not have a problem with townhouses as long as I try to keep them on the main thoroughfares instead of back in the residential neighborhoods. Um, as a lot, of, a lot of you know, I've down zoned about six or seven neighborhoods or put a contextual overlay on them. Um, there was a lot of the uh, uh, zoning in my area, zone R, which allowed single and two family or duplexes. So over the years, I've had about six, at least six neighborhoods that I've had to go back and either put a contextual overlay in or a down zoning to RS uh, to keep them from tearing down homes and putting two houses on one lot. Uh, most of the residents, when they saw that happening, uh, they didn't like that. They didn't want it. So we had community meetings and majority of people uh, voted to have those areas rezoned. Um, some other areas in Lakewood, I've got one guy that's been buying up a lot of property in Lakewood. His plan is eventually to redevelop that whole area um, because there are some of the buildings in there have been there probably over 60 years that are pretty dilapidated. Now, the big news is, if everybody knows where Wofford's Market is, Wofford's Market has been there forever. And it was auctioned off about three or four years ago and it had a demolition permit on it. Lady bought it and she went to the uh, property standards board to try and renovate it. And I went at least two or three times, objected to it, um, she, they gave her time to uh, renovate it. I stayed on codes about it in a pretty regular manner because a lot of the residents were complaining about it. It is finally being torn down. 
and it's unfortunate. <laughs> so everybody's happy about that. And it's unfortunate because the problem with the property is it has no access to sewers. Uh, it's, it was on a septic system and the closest sewer is underneath the railroad tracks over toward uh, Hopewell. So that, that can never, that's not gonna happen. So right now it's being torn down. We'll see what Metro does with it after that. I'm sure they'll put a lien on it for the cost of the demolition. I think that's about $60,000 because it has some asbestos in it. The other news is um, I've had a developer approach me about the old flooded out apartments back there on Hermitage Avenue that's close to the Hermitage. Um, that is zoned for senior living or senior assisted living. So I've talked to Howard Cottrell at the Hermitage and he's discussed it with Mr. Cottrell and they wanna to try to redo that particular apartment complex and make it uh, either senior assisted living or to make it um, uh, senior apartment living which everybody kind of agrees that's a good place for that to be back there. It doesn't create a lot of, whole lot of traffic um, and it's already zoned for that. So he has been in discussions with me on that. Uh, we, the only other restaurant we got added was Chipotle right there at Oja Boulevard and Lebanon Road. That was the old steak and shake over there. Uh, you go up Lebanon Road, um, there'll be a development back there behind Lady Nashville and Lisa Ann Lane. That's about 250 houses. It was already zoned that way. Uh, the good thing is they're living on about 60 acres of that property back there as open property with walking trails. But then I heard the other day, it borders the Wilson County line right there at due west. And supposedly they've got preliminary approval to put like 250, 260 houses on the Wilson uh, side of the county line. So um, Miss Evans, you're gonna have a lot of traffic coming down toward Andrew Jackson Parkway. That's all I can say, but <laughs> that's probably where they're gonna come out is either there, they're gonna come out on Lee Sand Lane and I've got a lot of them coming out on Lebanon Road, but it's, 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 part, of the, it's part of the problems that we have, you know, with developments and can't fight all the time. Um, there is an 80 unit development going on at Lady Nashville, but it was already zoned MUL. And it's next to one of my rental houses that's on the Wilson County side of the line. So there wasn't much I could do about it. It was already zoned that way. So that's being built over there now. Um, as far as uh, issues with infrastructure, I've worked hard toward that end. I work a whole lot with, uh, especially stormwater to make sure we don't have the flooding problems that we used to have in our area. And fortunately, I don't get a lot of calls about flooding in the area as I did when I first went on the council. And they've done a pretty good job of coming out there. And I show them areas where there are spots when it rains heavy that we need to ensure that our drains are cleared and our ditches and culverts are uh, free of any debris. So I, I think those kind of little things you have to take care of. To, to ensure that the public is getting their money's worth for their taxes. And um, that's about all I got to report. And anybody can call me at 615-972-4335. That's my cell phone. They can text me or you can get me at larry.hager at nashville.gov. And I appreciate the opportunity to be on here with y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hager. Appreciate the update. Okay, we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one's not really specific. So uh, whoever wants to grab it, grab it. Uh, it. It's really more pertinent for the council members. John, I've got one saved for you, so don't worry. Um, the first question uh, has to do with litter and the litter problem uh, in the Donaldson and Hermitage area. Uh, the specific question is what can and is being done about the out of control litter problem? Um, and the following comment uh, comes also is that there needs to be uh, enforcement, public awareness, uh, or maybe even a television and radio campaign. So I don't know who would like to take that. 
Well, I, I can go. Jordan, I, you might tell them what the HNA has been doing about uh, different uh, pickups in the, in, in the districts. Um, that's a good alley -oop right there, right? Well, yeah, the, the only thing is, Jeff, the, the guy that made the comment has has been with us before I mean, we're in our monthly pickup. So uh, it's preaching to the choir. <laughs> I, I got you. Well, I, I will say big thanks to you and DHNA for doing the pickups in each of our districts. Uh, they're very successful and, and truly appreciated. Um, I've been getting a lot of emails, phone calls, texts about the, the, the litter in the area. And especially when it, be, when it comes to Lebanon Pike, Briley Parkway, the, 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 the coordination between state areas, uh, metro areas, when it really comes down to a collaboration between state, metro, and volunteer efforts. I'll give you a perfect example. In front of my neighborhood on Lebanon Pike, between Briley and Donaldson Hills Drive down to Mill Creek, that's a dangerous area to try to put uh, volunteers. Um, so I always tell folks, use Hub. Um, you can certainly call our, our state representatives and, and try to get some support there from, from the state. Um, those sections that are not safe to have volunteers, we should try to use government services to do that. The other areas along Metro roads or whatnot, your beautification commissioner, your council member, and certainly anybody can put together uh, volunteer teams to go uh, clean them up. And your beautification commissioner can help you get some resources uh, from Metro in regards to vests, pickup items or whatnot. And if you're ever gonna put together a, uh, a team, a volunteer team that is in a potentially un unsafe area, but you wanna go clean it up, do not hesitate to call the Hermitage Precinct. And they're wonderful that they will be there to, to help you and make sure you're safe to, to do that. But ultimately, I, I think it, it's a collaborative effort. It's an ongoing, consistent effort uh, all, all the time. And I'm very thankful always to all the volunteers um, who help keep our community beautiful. Yep. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, next question, this is gonna be directed at Council Member Evans, uh, specifically around uh, some traffic issues. And the question is, uh, are there any updates around speeding on Andrew Jackson Parkway? So unfortunately, I wouldn't say there's a lot of um, options for change other than enforcement on Andrew Jackson Parkway. Um, I've uh, gone down the path of looking at a variety of things, um, things like lowering the speed limit, um, you know, would traffic calming potentially be appropriate? Um, and ultimately, all of those things, uh, avenues were, were not ones that were feasible um, because it's considered, you know, a major road. And the concern, of course, is about impeding first responders, especially in particular, since we have, you know, the fire station um, on Andrew Jackson Parkway. So it's definitely a concern. It's one that I hear about frequently. Um, I have looked at, there's a, been a couple of other council districts that have had some creative kind of paint-based traffic calming um, applications. And I'm uh, waiting to find out some more information about how successful some of those applications were um, as opposed to a physical installation. Um, I've also initiated having additional patrols, um, you know, through our previous um, community liaison um, prior to Sergeant Weaver. Uh, and so that has been helpful as well. But essentially residents just do not have any fear um, that they are going to be uh, ticketed on Andrew Jackson Parkway. And so I think that is part of our challenge. Um, and so, you know, always looking for information, ideas um, about what we could do instead. You know, we, we've had, we've looked at some of the restriping efforts, you know, that are closer to the old Hickory Boulevard portion. Um, so I've looked at a variety of things and unfortunately I don't have a good solution at this point other than talking to residents along that street um, about doing some different, you know, slow down campaigns and, and those kinds of things um, to potentially make people think a little bit more. We have put out the, um, the, uh, the speed uh, tool that MNPD has. 
um, previously that registers how fast people are going, um, but it's been a little while. So anyway, I wish I had a better, I wish I had a litter solution, <laughs> like everybody can volunteer and cars will slow down, but I don't have one, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, next question uh, directed at Mr. Little. Uh, comes from one of our members. Uh, the question is around a recent social media trend that is causing school bathrooms to be vandalized. Um, one, are you aware of any of these instances happening uh, in Metro Nashville schools? Uh, and if it has occurred, what steps are being taken to address them? Yeah, and can you hear me okay, Mr. Huffman? Yeah, I, I have not heard of that one. I'll tell you the, the most things have come by my through my email or through my phone call is like COVID-19 protocols. Um, just recently, parents are calling if they're exposed to a kid uh, that had COVID, they have to quarantine for 10 days. And it's really driving a few parents batty who have literally had their kids on the protocol um, two or three times, which that's a whole month if it's three times. Um, other than that, you know, we talked about some of the things that are happening at McGavick, some of the positive things, some of the things that we can be doing better, but the bathrooms, no. Um, I heard Councilman Hager talk about he, he graduated from McGavick. Um, I've spoke with Mr. Syracuse, and I think it's almost time to really look at, like, how do we not renovate, but how do we, like, fully redevelop McGavick High? Um, just listening to teachers and some of the community members, that's another thing that's kind of been on um, the mind of parents and community members in District 4. Great, thank you. And one more thing, not really a question, but still directed at you, uh, around uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing the Rescue Act funds survey link uh, in the, the chat here. Uh, that question was directed to you, actually, I don't know why. You say the Rescue Act funds? Yes, yes. Um, yes, um, if you would allow me to share, I mean, it's one thing that I've actually been studying and looking at as I heard councilman at large, Mr. Mendez talk about it. I was like, this is what I'm looking at. Um, and I can send this out to people, but if I could, I'll show others just where we are. Um, sure. So this is the plan that we have to submit to the state. And, and it really breaks down what we plan to use the monies for. But as you look um, at funding, and I'll try to blow it up just a little bit, um, hopefully that's better. You look at ESSA one allocation, it was 26.3 million. ESSA two, you know, quadruple to 123. Um, and then as we looked at our last allocation on ESSA 3.0, it was 276 million. And then you see a couple of other allocations. ELC, someone told me what that was about. I can't remember, but also we got about 2.3 in homeless. So additional funds um, for Metro National Public Schools for the next two to three school years, we have about 450 million, um, really 451 million since it's 450.8. And so this is something that I just continue to talk to the district about. They have sent out surveys, but also listening to parents, listening to community members on how we best repurpose the money to best serve our students. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's see, next question. I'm uh, gonna hand this one off to uh, council member Bradford. Um, and it's around a mask mandate. Uh, the person indicates that they saw you on the news talking about it. Um, if a mask mandate is passed at the next council meeting, how long will it be in effect for and uh, will it be enforced? I appreciate that question. So two of the things, those, both those um, questions that you asked have been brought up as concerns about the current mandate or current legislation as it's written. So as it's written, there does not appear to be any type of end date to it. It just is worded to sound like any time that there is a health emergency. So I'm going to, at the next council meeting, I'm going to have a discussion with the chief sponsor of the bill to see what we can do on that. As far as the enforcement, we've been told by MMPD that it's not enforceable because it would not be a criminal, it'd just be a civil. Um, so there's going to be that. But the biggest thing for the legislation is there are some businesses that, you know, they would like to be able to 
enforce a, a mandate inside their own businesses, but would rather have a citywide mandate to kind of fall back on. So that is one thing that this bill would allow is just to allow individual businesses who want to have the mandate and be able to enforce it. And at the end of the day, um, this whole, during this whole pandemic, that's really how we should have been handling this is it's the businesses that are the ones that are on the front line of this. And we can have the mandate, we can ask MMPD to come out there, but we already know MMPD is understaffed. And last summer they concentrated purely on downtown. But it's, it's the businesses that are going to be the real game changer on this. And if anything we can do to allow these businesses to have that extra comfort in enforcing their own policies, then it's a good thing. And uh, Jordan, yes, sir. Quick, I can add to that. This is Larry sure. Hager. Um, I just got an AG opinion came in today, and I'm letting legal look at that now. Um, Council Member Mendez may have seen it, I don't know, but it's an AG opinion about the mass mandates and who can enact the mass mandates. So I sent it over to legal, and hopefully, I'll have a definitive answer before the next meeting as to who can enact and pass the mass mandates in each particular county. So uh, based on what I'm reading from the AG opinion, it appears that the health department is the only one and the mayor can do it under special ordinances or statutes. So I'll have more information on that before the next meeting, Larry. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see. Uh, looks like we've got one more question. Uh, I'm going to direct this one to Council Member Mendez, uh, and it's a clarification uh, to where we currently are in the uh, LPR process. Um, so LPRs are uh, license plate readers, um, and um, this is one of these things that every once in a while the council gets uh, pretty bogged down um, because the community has uh, different opinions about whether license plate readers are a good idea or a bad idea. And um, I'd say out of 40 council members, there's probably about mm, 15 different views about how exactly we should go about license plate readers. And um, so we don't really have consensus. And I, I would say where we are right now is um, that we, we had a period about a year ago where there were a couple competing bills. Um, one would liberally allow license plate readers to, um, and the argument is to cut down on crime, uh, try to stop drag racing. And then uh, a competing bill that would just minimally allow license plate readers in order to um, have maximum um, uh, cutting down on a surveillance state. So we're not all uh, being able to being to get located full time all the time. And so we, we had two competing bills. Um, it was a draw in the council. Nobody could pass anything. And so we decided to think about it for a while. We had a bunch of meetings. Um, and uh, I would say we're, and we've gone through that cycle a couple times now. And I would say right now we're in the um, let's study it for a while um, phase. And it's not clear right now that there is going to be consensus to pass anything, um, whether it's uh, the very liberal, let's allow them everywhere, or just barely um, allow them in a couple places. Um, a lot of times when we get in one of these cycles, sooner or later, we do reach a consensus. Um, the fact is that we've got um, some people, a lot of people in the community, um, uh, very aggressively talking about, we don't need this to be a surveillance state where anybody can be located at any point anywhere in the county. On the other hand, we've got neighborhoods that legitimately want to know who's coming in and out of the neighborhoods to try to fight um, crime and cut down on stolen cars and break-ins. And we're, we're, you know, so far trying to find a good balance between the two, but we're not there yet. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for the update. Appreciate it. Uh, we did have a couple more questions come in. Well, one, one comment and one question. Uh, I'll direct the question first to council member Syracuse uh, specifically. Uh, is there anything, um, let's see. 
is there anything in the world for the land where the old Kmart was other than a big parking lot? Ah, that's an excellent question. It's a wonderful site that has a lot of development potential. I have only received one really bona fide proposal that has never gotten any legs on it to actually start. Um, and, and the concept basically was kind of like a main street uh, where you'd have a road going in and, and on, on the sides could be some residential, could be some hotel, could be um, uh, re retail or whatnot. A nice, a nice concept. Um, but in full transparency, that was the only thing that anybody had ever really uh, put forth that uh, they put before me and said, hey, what do you think? And I thought it was a good idea of worthy of a community conversation about it, but um, um, nothing ever came of it. But uh, it is an extraordinary site so close to the highway that has a lot of potential. But as of right now, um, nothing, nothing uh, tangible has, has, uh, has, has started. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and then the last comment, and Council uh, Member Evans, it's more directed at you since you're the only Hermitage rep on. Uh, the comment is, uh, I would love to see a new recycling center in the Hermitage area. Our closest one is at McGavick High. It's heavily used and often overflowing. Um, anything you can provide uh, to uh, allow a new recycling center uh, would be greatly appreciated. So this is a one I have a love hate relationship with um, the love side is I personally am a recycler and uh, invested in recycling and always at home. Um, but the, the challenge has been that since we lost the site at Goodwill um, in Councilman Hager's district, uh, we really Metro has not been able to locate a good um, location for the Hermitage part of town. Uh, we have the Lakewood site, you know, that's accessible to all of us and then the McGavick site. So there's not one that's really um, easily accessible or something that Metro can invest in that's closer into Hermitage, um, in particular because the school system isn't interested um, in adding more recycling centers to their properties because it, they do take up um, space, but also because of, of really, I would say the disrespect um, that a lot of people um, have had towards the existing recycling centers. For instance, um, leaving materials behind whenever bins are overflowing and making a mess you know, on school property um, that then Metro has to come out and clean up. Also our effectiveness as a city um, on recycling efforts, um, it's improved some, um, but we have a long way to go and I, we don't make it very easy. It's, very comp it's a complicated issue, of course, that is tied in a lot of respects to uh, money and, and what it costs for the city. Um, but I know that I investigated right after I was elected, you know, if there was a site available um, in District 12 and I didn't have any Metro owned property other than uh, MNPS's two schools that are in the district. And so that really limited options for me without Metro buying land uh, to be able to have a site up. And so that meant kind of going out further. Um, and then you have site restrictions as far as the size of the existing sites, the current uses and, and that kind of thing. So I think it's something that people, you know, we still talk about, um, but at the same time, once we kind of dug into the availability and what that might look like, it's become less of a priority. Um, and so I appreciate the comment and I'll keep asking about it. Um, I don't have high hopes for it at this point uh, for it being something that would happen, you know, during my term. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, a lot of great information here tonight. Uh, you know, it would have been great to do this in person uh, once again, but uh, the pandemic definitely had uh, different plans in mind. Uh, I want to thank each of you uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, each of you participants definitely could have been doing other things with your time, but you chose to uh, come and get in front of the community that you serve and provide updates on uh, uh, many important projects and answer questions. Um, and uh, that really goes a lot uh, and says a lot about you. So thank you for that. And thank you at home as well uh, for tuning in to this uh, first in the series of State of Donaldson and Hermitage interviews. 
uh, and thank you for your support of the DHNA. Uh, it's been our goal to ensure that we provide you with accurate information and direct access to the individuals who represent you in our government. Um, I do invite you to the second part of our State of Donaldson and Hermitage series, which will take place on October the 12th at 7 p.m. That part will uh, include the state and federal components of our government and will include Senator Heidi Campbell, Representative Darren Jernigan, and Representative Jim Cooper. So we're very excited to continue this series. Um, until next time, I'm Jordan Huffman, and I hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you all.